we are um, up to the point in the Gemara where we're still trying to prove definitively whether or not Beis Shammai actually put their Psach Halacha into practice. And we had seen two Bryces yesterday where that seemed pretty clear, but now the Gemara is going to give the final Makkah uh, B'Patish, the final hammer blow. So Tashma, the first line on Dav Tezayin Amar Aleph, Bimei Rebbe Dosa Bin Horkinus Hutra Tzara Sabas La'achin, that the Bryce says explicitly that in the, in the generation of Rebbe Dosa, who was the Godel Hador of the time, uh, Tzara Sabas was permitted. So it's clear that Shmamina Asu Shmamina. So that's a clear indication that if you paskin like Beis Shammai, you actually put that psak into practice. Because according to Beis Hillel, obviously a tsara of a of an erva is not permitted. So gufa. Let's now analyze that brisa. Bimei Rebbe Dosa ben Horkinus Hitiru Tsara Sabas Laachin. That in Rebbe Dosa's lifetime, in his generation. Uh, a, a psak was issued that a tsara sabas is permitted. Now this was very difficult in the eyes of the sages. Rabbi Dosa was the Gadol Hador. He's living in a generation before the whole story in Yavna of Rabbi Gamliel, and Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah, and Rabbi Yehoshua. These, are, these rabbis are alive, but they're much younger rabbis at, during this stage of the story. And so Rabbi Dosa is the Gadol Hador, the, uh, the junior sages are under the assumption that he has issued this psak, that he's issued this psak that uh, Tzara Sabas is muteris like Beishamai. And it was very difficult for them because Shechacham Gadol Haya, because he was a great scholar, and how are they going to stand up to him? And furthermore, the of Kamu Milavala Beis HaMedrash, and his eyes had already grown dim, meaning that he was already now uh, disabled as an elderly person, couldn't come to the base medrash anymore, couldn't see anymore. So they're going to have to go now visit him, send a delegation to visit him, and challenge his psak halacha. So amru mi yelech v'yodio. So who's, they said, who's going to go and tell him that we can't accept your psak because we go like Beis Hillel? So amr lahen Rebbe Yehoshua ani elech. So Rabbi Yeshua says, I will go. Rabbi Yeshua now is this of the new generation of Gedolim, and he says, I will go. The Acher of me, who will go after you? So Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah. Where was Rabbi Gamliel at this time? We're not really sure where he was. Maybe it wasn't befitting the covet of Anasi, or maybe this was during the time when Rabbi Gamliel had been temporarily been demoted. It's not clear, but this was during this period of time. And the Acher of me, and who, and after him, who will go? Who will be the third tier of students who will accompany you? They said Rabbi Akiva. Okay, so Rabbi Akiva is a great scholar, but he doesn't have the the yichus of uh, a Rabbi Yoshua and a Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah. So halchu va'amdu al Pesach beso nechnasa shivchasa. Amr lo Rabbi chachme Yisrael ba netzlacha etzlacha. So they go, they stand by the doorway. The maid sees these very distinguished rabbis. She comes in and tells Rabbi Dosa, Rabbi, you have the wise men of Israel who have come to visit you. So, Amar lo yikansu v'nichnasu. So he said, let them enter. They enter, and tafso le Rabbi Yehoshua b'hoshivehu al mita shel zahav. He grabs a hold of Rabbi Yehoshua, who must have been the first one in the room, even though Rabbi Dosa is blind, but he can detect that. And he places him on a golden couch. So Amr Lei Rebbe Amor La Talmidecha Acher Vyeshev. So Rabbi Yeshua says, "Thank you so much for your hospitality, but Rebbe, there's another student here with, uh, with me. Please uh, uh, give him permission to sit as well." Amr Lo Mihu. So Rabbi Dosa says, "Oh, who is that?" So as he said, "It's Rabbi Lazar Ben Azaria." So he said, "It says this is who it is." Amr Vyeshlo Ben Azaria Chaverenu. Ah, Geshmak. Our friend Azaria, who is his colleague, Rabdos is the, from the freer Dika generation. Our, our my chavir Azaria has a son who's a scholar. Kara alav hamikra hazeh. He recited about him the following pasuk. Now keep this pasuk in mind because we're going to analyze it later. Nar hoisi gam zokanti velo raisi tzadik nezav v'zaram levakesh lachem. I was a young man and I became old and I never saw a tzadik forsaken and his progeny seeking bread. In other words, if my friend Azaria was a great gadol, he was a great Talmud Chacham, then surely it should come true that his son Azariah, uh, Elazar should also become a scholar. So he, was, he happily grabbed him and placed him down on another golden couch. 
Amr lei Rebbe, Amor le Talmidecha, Cherbi Yeshev. So then Rabbi Yoshua says, Rebbe, please tell uh, your third student who's with me to come and be seated. Amr lei Umihu, who is that? Akiva ben Yosef. So, and this is before Rabbi Akiva is the great Rosh Yeshiva, right? So, Amar Lei, Atohu Akiva ben Yosef, Shashim Cholev, Misof Olam, Beatsofo. Are you the Akiva ben Yosef, whose name reverberates throughout the world? Shave ben Yishev, Kamoscha Yirbu be Yisrael. Sit, my son, sit. May there be more like you in Israel. Now, notice he doesn't put him on a golden couch. Could be a couple of reasons. Maybe he could have ran out of golden couches, right? That could be one reason. That could be the simple reason, right? You know, only so much furniture in uh, Rabbi Dosa's house. But it could also be that Rabbi Akiva at this point is not the most miyuchas. He didn't have the... He had the chops, but he didn't have the yichus to be able to, to sit down on a golden couch like the other two. Anyway, he's chilu misaf vimoso bahalacha osachi gil So they don't want to attack him right away. So they speak in a roundabout about all, a whole bunch of different halachos until eventually they get to the issue of tsara sabas. Amru le tsara sabas maho. So they said, Rebbe, what's the halacha by tsara sabas? Amru lahen machlokis veshama yebeisilo. He said, it's a machlokis, as you know. So halacha kedivrei me. So they asked him, so how do we paskin? Amru lahen halacha kebeisilo. Paskin like Basil, Tsara Sabas is Osir. So Amrulay, Valo Mishmecha, Amru Halacha Kebe Shamai. But Rebbe, you're being quoted as Paskining that Tsara Sabas is Mutter like Be Shamai. So Amr Lehem Dosa Shamatem O Bin Hurkin Shmatem. So Rebbe Dosa says, wait a minute, guys. Did you hear that in my name, Rebbe Dosa, that it's Mutter, or did you just hear it in the name of the son of Hurkinus? So Amrulei, Chaye Rebbe, Stam Shamanu. They said, we declare Rebbe, like it's a, it's a declarative, like how did you know? Yes, we didn't hear it that Rebbe Dosa said it, we just heard that the rabbi who's the son of Hyrcanus said it. So we assumed it was you. So Amr Lahem, Ach Katan Yeshli Bechor Satanhu. He says, I have a younger, I have a kid brother, and he's a Bechor Satan, he's a firstborn Satan. Now what that means is, he's a, like a wily, shrewd, Really, really sharp guy. And uh, some other Girsos have is a Bachur Shanun, that he's a very, very sharp Bachur. <clears throat> but no matter how you look at it, he was giving him a backhanded compliment of saying, You better watch out for this guy. He is brilliant, and he's going to, he'll run circles around you. So the Yonason Shmo, his name is Yonason, Vuhumi Talmide Shamai, and he happens to be a student of Shamai, unlike myself. Vihizaru Shloi Kafech Eschem Bahalachos. He says, be careful, don't get into a, a, a debate with my brother Yonasan, because he's got 300 arguments why it's Aras Abbas is mutter. However, However, I can give you testimony, and I bear, uh, bring heaven and earth to testify as my witnesses, that on this very millstone, Chagai the prophet sat and he taught three halachas. Number one, Tzara Sabas Asura. The Tzara, like Basila, that it's Asur. And no matter what, so therefore, no matter what Yonasan is going to argue with you, logic only takes you so far. If you got a Mesorah going back to the Nevi'im, all bets are off. Next, number two, Amonu Moav Ma'asrin Maestr Ani Bashvius. Now, this is a halacha, as we'll see in just a moment, having to do with the Shemitah year. Now, the territories abutting Eretz Yisrael are called Amon and Moab. I believe it's where Jordan is. And essentially, what he was saying is that even though at one time they were annexed and made part of Eretz Yisrael, but they no longer have the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael. And therefore, the laws of Shemitah no longer apply to those lands, even though they may be considered to be part of Eretz Yisrael for other purposes, but for Kedusha Shavias, they don't. And the Chachamim were there for Gozer, that any Jews who live in that area on the Transjordan have an obligation to tithe during the Shemitah year and leave over part of their produce for the poor. The reason being is because um, even though it's not part of Eretz Yisrael, but they still have to give charity from their agriculture because of, especially during Shemitah, people are going to be poor in Eretz Yisrael. They're not going to have produce, enough sufficient produce, because they're not allowed to cultivate the soil. So they have to rely on their friends on the other side of the Jordan to, to feed them. So that was the takana, that they have to take 
they have to tithe, they work the soil, doesn't have any Kedusha Shavias, and that's another thing that Chagai testified. And number three, <laughs> The third thing that he testified is that we're allowed to accept converts from the Gentiles that are living in these two areas called Karduyan and Tarmudim. And the reason why you might think that it's forbidden, as we'll discuss later on, is that perhaps some of these people are actually Jewish and who turned to apostasy, and maybe some of them are Mamzerim. And therefore we would not be allowed to accept them into the fold of the Jewish people because we would be introducing Mamzerus into the Jewish community. But we'll see, we'll learn about that shortly. So Tana Kishinichnasu Nichnasu Befesach Echad, Kishiyatsu Yatsu Bishlosh Psachim. So the end the end part of the story is that Shlemi, remind me I have to speak to you about something. So the Brysa says when they came in to visit Rebbe Dosa, they came in through one door. But when they left, they left through three different doorways. Now why did they do that? So Tosfus gives us two explanations. One is because they wanted to avoid all meeting up with Rabbi Dosa's brother Yonason at one time, because if, if he would present them with this 300 arguments, they would have to submit to him. They wouldn't be able to find the terrets. And if they all agreed at the same time that he was right, they'd have to submit to his halachic psak, and they didn't want to. Another reason is, that's the first reason. The second reason, since Tysus is much more simple, they just wanted to spread out so they could find him faster, so they could put a stop to his psak halacha. Anyway, Pagabo Berebi Akiva, Akshilei V'ukme. So the first person to meet up with him was Rebbe Akiva, and Rabbi Yonah's son ran circles around him. He basically, Rebbe Akiva asked him all of these kashas, and Rabbi Yonason defended his position, and Rabbi Akiva was stymied. So, Amr lo, atahu Akiva, shishim cha'olech misofa, olam v'yad sofo, ashrecha shizachisa l'sham v'adain lo higata l'orei boker. So he says to him, almost in a mocking fashion, you're Akiva, whose name reverberates throughout the world? Fortunate are you, Akiva, who's gained such a reputation, but you're not even up to the level of a cattle uh, herder yet. You're not even up to that level. So Rabbi Akiva, Amr lo, Rabbi Akiva, afilu l'roitzon. Rabbi Akiva responds to him, humbling himself even further, you're right, I'm not even up to a shepherd yet, not only, let alone not only a cattle herder, but I'm not even up to a shepherd. Obviously there's imagery here that has to be analyzed further. But the point is that there's nothing wrong with being humbled by someone who bests you using, you know, very powerful, the... Uh, the, the arts of rhetoric and persuasion and dialectics and Talmudic uh, f- uh, fancy footwork, but at the end of the day, even though you know you've been you've been bested, you have to hold your ground. That's what we're learning from Rabbi Akiva. Amon Umoav Ma'asrin Meiser Ani Bashvius. So the next halacha was that Amon and Moav have a din of being chutz la'aretz, and the rabbis ordained that people who live there, Jews who live there, have to take uh, meiser ani to feed their brethren in Eretz Yisrael during Shemitah. And the reason is, is because even though Ammon and Moab was originally conquered, it was conquered by, by Moshe and, and maintained by Yehoshua, and it was considered to be part of Eretz Yisrael proper in the times of Bayez Rishon. However, when the Jews were exiled by Nebuchadnezzar and they came back for the second temple period, it was not recaptured, and a Kedusha Rishon a Kitshala Shaita Velo Kitshala Asilava. And the original Kedusha that was imbued within the annexed properties outside of Eretz Yisrael was only temporary. So by the time it's in the Bavel, if it's not part of Eretz Yisrael proper today, it doesn't have any Kedusha anymore. And they deliberately did not annex these territories and make it part of Kedusha Eretz Yisrael, so that there would be territories adjacent to Eretz Yisrael to feed the poor in Eretz Yisrael during the Shemitah year. Unfortunately, we don't have such hospitable uh, neighbors today, so it becomes much harder during the Shemitah year. So things were, were, that's why we have to work extra hard to make sure that the, uh, the Jews living in Eretz Yisrael today have a healthy economy during Shemitah, even those who are relying on the agricultural part of the economy. And finally, number three, and that we accept converts from these lands. 
Eni, is this really so? Vahatani Rami Bar Yecheskel in Makablum Gerimina Karduyim. Didn't Rami Bar Yecheskel teach that we don't accept Gerim from uh, the Karduyim? So Amar Ravashi, Kartuyim Itmar. Ravashi says, no, Rav, to Rami Bar Yecheskel was talking about the Kartuyim, and the Karduyim are a different <coughs> group of people. Kedah Armi Inshi, Kartuyim Pisulim. As people say that the Kartuyim you cannot accept because we have to worry that they that they descend from Jews who may have had Mamzerus introduced, and therefore we even though they hold themselves to be heathens today, we cannot accept them if they want to be Magyar. The Ika da Amri, others learn that Tani Rami Bar Yecheskel in Makablum Gerim in Kartuyim, that it was known that explicitly that he had said Kartuyim with a tough. But my love, Haino Kartuyim, Haino Karduyim. And our assumption was there's no difference between Kartuyim and Karduyim with a Dalid. And on that, Omar Ravashi, Lo Kartuyim, Lechud, Be Kartuyim, Lechud. And Ravashi said, no, they're two separate groups of people. Kida Amri Inshi, Kartuyim, Pisili. As people say, only Kartuyim are puzzle, but Kartuyim we do accept. Rabbi Yochanan, Vesabiyo, Dharmi Turavayo, Ein Makablum Gerimin HaTarmudim. Now, the other group that we said that we accept Geirim from are the Tarmudim, but Rabbi Yochanan and a, a sage named Sabia, not a very common sage, is quoted as saying that we don't accept Geirim from the Tarmudim people. So the Gemara says, Since when did Rabbi Yochanan say this? That all uh, blood stains that are found on fabric are considered to be tohar. Now, what we're talking about is menstrual blood that is found, blood stains that are found on fabric, let's say bed sheets and things like that. Do they transmit tumma? Well, if they come from a Jew, they transmit tumma. If they come from a non-Jew, there's no laws of nida, of tumas nida by a non-Jew, and therefore it doesn't tr- transmit tumma. So the, the Mishnah says that if the blood stain comes from the territory of Rechem, you can assume that it's completely, almost completely non-Jewish in that area, vast majority are non-Jews, so therefore any blood stains on fabric that's found from that area is assumed to be from a non-Jew and therefore is tohar. The Reb Yehuda metame mipnei shehen geirim v'tomi b'na obdei kocha v'tohen. Period. And Rabbi Yehuda says, no, those blood stains are tame, and the reason is, is because even when you know that they come from a heathen, many of the heathens in the Rechem territory originate from Jews, and they just basically went off the derech, like Rashi says, Shehimiru that, um, that, uh, the, the, what happened was that there were, Jew, there were non-Jews who had converted in Rechem, en masse, and then, after a while, I guess when the Jews were no longer popular, they went back to their old ways. But because they had converted a halacha, these people have the din of Jews, and even if though, though they're behaving today as non-Jews, but halachically their blood still transmits to them. But then finally the Mishnah says, that any fabric that has a blood stain that comes from a, a, a land or a territory that is predominantly uh, idolatrous, you may assume that that fabric is tohar. The Havinan ba, and it was a discussion was ensued about that statement, about that Mishnah, <laughs> that it seems like that any area which is predominantly idolatrous uh, is considered to be Gentile completely, and therefore any fabric is considered to be tohar. And that would include tarmod, which is predominantly uh, a Gentile. And Rabbi Yochanan said, based on that Mishnah, which talks about there's no tuma in Tarmod, it would also seem that you can accept converts from Tarmod. You don't have to worry that the people there are originally Jewish, and that there may be some mamzeris there. So the Gemara says, you see from here that Rabbi Yochanan says, we do accept converts from Tarmod. How could he have said previously that, that we don't accept Gerim from Tarmod? So the Chitei Mazos Velos maybe you'll tell me that Rabbi Yochanan was just commenting on what you see from that Mishnah, but he himself personally doesn't paskin like that Mishnah. Maybe that's the way to resolve it. The Gemara says, you can't say that because Vahama Rabbi Yochanan Halacha Kista Mishnah. But Rabbi Yochanan says, we always paskin like an anonymous Mishnah. This Mishnah was stated anonymously, and Rabbi Yochanan says well, that's always the halacha, so you see that Rabbi Yochanan holds that we do accept Geirim from Tarmot. So the Gemara says, The answer is, says the Gemara, that really it's a machlokis of, among the students of Rabbi Yochanan. One group of students of Rabbi Yochanan quoted him as saying that we don't accept converts, and another group of students had said that Rabbi Yochanan had adduced from the Mishnah that we do accept Geirim from Tarmot. And it's a dispute as to what Rabbi Yochanan actually said. 
So now the Gemara asks, okay, fine, me tarmud my time alone. Why don't, what would be the argument to say that we don't accept converts from Tarmo? So, Pligi by Rabbi Yochanan Vesabia. So here, according to this group of students who quote Rabbi Yochanan is, is not <coughs> permitting it, the question, the, there's a machlokus between Rabbi Yochanan and his colleague Sabia. Chad Amr Mishum Avdei Shlomo Bechad Amr Mishum Benos Yerushalayim. In both cases, there's the fear of bastardy. There's the fear that there are Jewish people there that are mamzerim. Now, in order to understand this Gemara properly, you have to appreciate that this Gemara goes according to a halacha that we don't paskin like. And that is that if a goy has relations with a Jewish woman and she becomes pregnant, the offspring is a mamzer. Now, we don't paskin that way at all. We paskin, as we'll see, and hopefully I think we're going to see it tomorrow's daf, that we paskin that the, the offspring is a full-fledged 100% Jew with no questions asked. There's no mamzerus there. But this Gemara is going according to the Shita that if a Gentile is intimate with, a, impregnates a Jewish woman, the, the offspring is a mamzer. That's the basis for this whole Gemara. So the question is, where is this fear of all of these non-Jews who impregnated Jewish women? One says it has to do with the servants of, of King Solomon, and the other one says it's the daughters of Jerusalem. So Bishlam Laman Dharma Mishum Avde Shlomo Kesovar Obikul Khabim Vevid al Bal Basi Sola Vlad Mamzer. So I can understand if you're telling me that it goes back to the time of the servants of Shlomo Melech. The servants of Shlomo Melech were extremely wealthy because Shlomo Melech was the wealthiest, he was the he was the Bill Gates of his era as far as wealth. And so therefore anyone who worked for him, even a, a lowly slave, was was massively wealthy. So because of their wealth, they carried themselves as Jewish, even though they had never converted, and therefore they misrepresented themselves to Jewish women. The Jewish women married them, and they had children. And therefore this, uh, uh, this opinion of Rabbi Yochanan holds that the, ch- the children of such unions are mamzerim. But if you tell me it's because of the daughters of Jerusalem, what's the story of the daughters of Jerusalem? Where is the Mamzerus there? So So the details is the point of Machlokes, but it's basically the same issue. The only difference of opinion is, is how many how many troops there were of the non-Jews that came in to invade Jerusalem when it was time to destroy the temple in the times of Nebuchadnezzar. One says that there were 12,000 soldiers plus 6,000 archers, and the other one is that there were 12,000 or you know warrior soldiers, and among those 12,000 warrior soldiers were 6,000 archers. So it was 12,000 total, according to the second opinion. That when the heathens came to invade and take over Jerusalem, almost all of the soldiers went in to and went after the gold and silver, because the temple was very opulent, except for these 12 or 18,000 soldiers. They looked at the daughters of Jerusalem as being much more beautiful than gold and silver, and therefore they took them for themselves. Shenemar nashim b'tzion inu b'sulos ba'ari Yehuda, as it says in the book of Eicha, that women in Zion were violated, virgins in the cities of Judea. Amr Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachmeni, Amr Rabbi Yenasan, pasuk zes har ha'olam Amra. Okay, now we're going to go back to the Agadita where we talked about. Remember, Rabbi Dosa had said, "Nar ha'yisi gam zakanti." I was a youth and I became old, and I never saw a tzaddik forsaken and his offspring seeking bread. So Amru nar. So this pasuk was said by the Sar ha'olam the officer of the world. I spoke about this a few years ago when I talked about the angel Metatron, um, who, was, who was really a, um, known as the Sar Ha'olam, the angel of the world. We just read Parshas Bereshis, and we learned about a man named Chanoch. Chanoch disappears because God has taken him away. What happened to Chanoch? According to ancient Midrashim, Chanoch was converted into an angel. And his na- name was turned into Matatron, and he was known as the Sar Ha'olam. He was the angelic being who oversees the entire world. For those of you familiar with Marvel Comics, remember of the Watcher, right? So, anyway, some similar idea. Stan Lee got everything from Chazal. So, what? 
in, in, okay. There's a lot of there's a, there is a huge amount of literature about Matatron about Sar Olam. We don't have we, we we just can't go into it now. So Amru. So but the Gemara says this is the person who said this pasuk. This is the uh, this is the person, the individual who said this pasuk. And how do you know this? So Ilema so Man Amri, who said the pasuk? Ilema Kudshavrichu Miika Zikna Kame. You can't say that it's Hashem. Because Hashem does not is not young, nor does he grow old. Ve'ela David Amrei mikashish kulehai. You can't say that David Hamelech said it, because David Hamelech only lived seventy years, and therefore you you know if you're trying to comment on this the divine system of justice throughout history, you, David is not qualified to make such a sweeping statement that a tzaddik is never forsaken. It really takes an angel who sees the entire span of Jewish history. Because in the short term, sometimes you will see a tzaddik being forsaken, right? And you will see his progeny seeking bread. But if you look at the long sweeping scope of Jewish history, like Matatron is capable of doing, you will see that eventually justice is achieved and the tzaddik receives his proper reward. Maybe not in his generation, maybe not in his child's generation, but in some ensuing generation, the schar will, will come. So, therefore, you have to conclude that it was uttered by Metatron. The Maharal explains that the whole idea of Nar Hoisi Gamza Kanti is that Metatron is able to look at the earlier part of world history when the world, when civilization is immature. And he says that that's what's when I was a nar. That's when I, representing the world, was a nar. Mm-hmm. Zakanti means when the world becomes mature and civilization advances. Then I look at the scope of all of this, all of the landscape of, of the chronology of thousands of years, and I'm able to see the justice of the God's divine system. Let's go on to another pasuk. It says in Eicha, talking about <coughs> the uh, the downfall of the Jewish people, it says, Yado paras tsar al kol machamadeha, that his hand has placed an, a, a, a oppressor upon all of its precious people. And this refers to Ze Amon Moav. This refers to Amon and Moav, who were the abutting neighbors of the Jewish people. And when they saw that the Jewish people were vulnerable to the Babylonians, they came and oppressed the Jews as well. That when the Babylonians came to destroy the temple, everyone else went to loot the gold and silver. But they went straight for the Sefer Torah that was in the Heichel. They said, this scroll which is a direct affront to our people, because it says that Ammonites and Moabites may not enter into the congregation of God, we will burn that, say, that scroll. Then we look at, an, at, at a, uh, a Pasuk, it also in, uh, later on in that very same parak in Eicha, it says, Tziva Hashem Liakov Sviva Tzarev Tzarev, that Hashem has given charge to the neighbors of Jerusalem to be the oppressor. And also that refers once again to Amun and Moab. So Amarav kegon homanya lopum nahara. And that's even true to this day, that the Gemara was aware of Jews who were living in a certain area by the mouth of a river, where there were also descendants of the Ammonim and Moavim who were also residing in that area. And to this very day, the Gemara says that the Jews are, are, are um, the brunt of anti-Semitic acts by these Ammonites and Moabites who live there as neighbors with the Jews at this place called Homania, which is by the mouth of the river. Amar of Yehuda, Amar of Asi, Ove kolchavim shekidesh bizman hazeh, choshushin lekidushin shema measeres hashvatim hu. Very important halachic discussion, again, this is not lahalacha, that if an heathen goes ahead and presents marriage kedushin to a woman, then we have to be choshesh that she's married because maybe this man is descended from one of the ten lost tribes. Because we know the ten lost tribes were scattered throughout the world. So maybe this is a guy who's, who's taka Jewish, even though he represents, he presents himself as a heathen. So therefore maybe she's mekudeshes. So frak the gemara vahol kol parish me ruba parish. 
One second, says the Gemara, but we know there's a halacha that if someone comes from a, a certain place where the majority of people are of one status, we assume he comes from that majority status. We know, okay, sure, we know that there are the scattered ten lost tribes throughout the world, but the majority of people in any given location are, are, are not Jewish are not descended from the ten lost tribes, so why don't we assume that he comes from the rove? Mm-hmm. So the Gemara answer is beduch de dekevi. The answer is, is because we have another principle that kol kavua kemechtsal mechtsa dami. That if you find an issue of suffolk in a place where you know that there's iser there, even if the iser is a minority, we treat it as 50-50. So in a situation where a man was makadesh a woman, in a place where we know that there are some remnants of the ten lost tribes, even though they're the minority, we view that any, any person in question who's living in that place as a 50-50 prospect. The Amar Rebbe Abba Bar Kahana, as uh, he pl- quoted the following pasuk in Melachim, which talks about how Sancheriv exiled the ten tribes. It says, "Where did he exile them to?" Vayanchem Bachelach Uvechavor Nahar Gozan Ve'arei Madai. These are the lands in which Sancheriv exiled the ten lost tribes. And the Gemara says, Rabbi Rab Abba says, I know exactly where these places are. He says, Chalach Zechilazon, Vechavor Zechadayav, and Nahar Gozan Zeginzak, Vere Madai Zechemdan Vechevroteha. This refers, to, Madai refers to Chemdan and its tributaries. So I know exactly where these places are. So if therefore a woman, a Jewish woman, goes to visit that place and she accepts Kiddushin from a man who's living there, maybe that man is from the Ten Lost Tribes. Va'amri Lazu Nihar Vechevroteha. And some say that it's Nihar and its tributaries. Chevrotehaman, and what are the tributaries? No, if you want to know exactly which towns we're talking about, Omar Shmuel, Kerach, Moshechei, Chidaki, Vedumkaya. Those are the names of the towns. But the bottom line is, is that if you find yourself in one of those places, then you talk, I have to be Choshesh, that a person is from the Ten Lost Tribes, and be Choshesh for the Kiddushan. We'll hold it here for today. Have a wonderful day.